Good morning. Nice to see everybody. Thursday is the annual meeting of the <clears throat> Infectious Disease Society of Oregon down in the Convention Center in Salem. The, our annual meeting occurs one day before and overlaps into the Oregon chapter of the American College of Physicians meeting, which starts on Friday. I think it runs till Saturday midday. Uh, we still have some tickets available for the Infectious Disease Society of Oregon uh, meeting. And I think many of you have seen our handout and brochures uh, over the last several weeks. We have outstanding faculty. I'm grateful to all of them. Uh, every year, the uh, national organization, the Infectious Disease Society of America, is helpful in providing a speaker at their expense, a national speaker, to join the local faculty, if you will. And this year, that guest is Larry Pickering. Dr. Pickering went to medical school in West Virginia, did his pediatric training and pediatric infectious disease training in uh, St. Louis, Wash U and then went to the University of Texas in Houston for a long and distinguished uh, career. Focused on his passions, which were vaccines, which we're going to hear about this morning, and diarrheal disease in infants and, and children. His work has been acknowledged by awards, teaching awards, academic awards, uh, um, administrative awards of untold number. I mean, I, I got dizzy reading through his list of acknowledgments and recognitions. Uh, activities that you may be aware of, he's the editor of, was the editor of the Red Book of Pediatrics, which is one of the Bibles of Pediatric Infectious Disease for four or five editions. He's the head editor of the Principles and Practice of Infectious Diseases in Pediatrics for four or five editions. He's been president of the uh, Pediatric Infectious Disease Society, longstanding member of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices of the CDC. I think I'm boring him by giving all this long list of his accomplishments, but it really is absolutely extraordinary. He's currently secretary to the board of directors of the Infectious Disease Society of America. So one last point, um, he and his wife, who joined him on this trip, have never been to the Pacific Northwest. I find that hard to believe. So will you help me join welcoming Dr. Pickering to Oregon? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a real, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and to talk about um, the making of vaccines, which is sometimes complicated and, and misunderstood. I have no conflicts of interest to declare uh, with any commercial products or providers of commercial services discussed in this presentation. Now, the topics to be discussed are here, and I, I think we can get through all of them. One is to clarify uh, between differences between the Food and Drug Administration 
uh, and the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices and how each of those fits into uh, the approval and licensure of uh, vaccines. Two is to discuss major components of and participant groups in the U.S. vaccine system. Once a recommendation is made, then there's a whole lot of other agencies and groups that kick in to uh, ensure that the vaccines become available and utilized uh, in people, adult, children and adults in, in the United States. To talk about <clears throat> lessons learned <clears throat> from making vaccine recommendations, it's interesting. You get expert panels that go through the recommendation and think about everything they can, what can happen, and so on. And still, once a vaccine is licensed, things will happen that you don't expect whatsoever. And some of them are even very positive. Um, consider the importance of herd protection or community immunity. Um, review the reproductive number for vaccines and to characterize acute flaccid myelitis, uh, which is a disease that presents very similar to polio. And then to unlink autism and vaccines. There have been a lot of individuals in this country that are negative toward vaccines and um, uh, are linking autism to the vaccines that their children receive. Uh, I think a lot of that probably is the, the real despair that parents have when they have a child who is autistic trying to find a cause. We will find a cause eventually, but it isn't vaccines. Now, the first objective is um, the Food and Drug Administration licensure of and the ACIP recommendations for vaccines and how that proceeds. Um, we wrote a couple articles. This one I think is reasonable because it combines um, Walt Ornstein from the CDC, um, Wellington Sun from the uh, FDA, and of course Carol Baker from everywhere. She's done everything. So the expertise is there to try to make uh, a manuscript that contains everything it should and also is uh, a fun to read. Now, the FDA licensure of vaccines follows through this. FDA, it's a regulatory agency of the government. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices is not regulatory. It's advisory to the director of the Center for Disease Control. The FDA licenses vaccines based on results of clinical studies and other data submitted to the FDA by vaccine manufacturers in the biological license application. So the only thing that the FDA considers is data that are in the BLA. If uh, we've done, if Dave and I have done a wonderful study on a vaccine, the FDA doesn't consider it unless it's in the, via the uh, biological license application submitted by the drug manufacturer. The ACIP consists, considers additional data and therefore recommendations may differ. The AC re recommendations, the ACIP recommendations consider not only data that are in the biological license application, but a whole lot of other data that have been gathered. International data, studies that the, uh, the FDA does not consider because it wasn't submitted to them. So that's why you see big, sometimes big differences in the recommendations versus the licensure of a vaccine. And we'll, we'll get into that. Now, as I said, the manufacturers of vaccines, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the manufacturers of vaccines can only market vaccines based upon licensure information in the package insert. So if you ask a drug rep about a specific vaccine, he or she will only be allowed uh, to tell you of what is submitted to the FDA. They can't talk about any of the other studies that have been done. Package inserts do not contain the ACIP recommendations. Now, the, the key elements for developing uh, the evidence-based recommendations by ACIP. So we're at the ACIP, we're at the CDC. These are the recommendations, <clears throat> the elements that are utilized to make these recommendations. <clears throat> One is, of course, vaccine safety, uh, vaccine effectiveness, uh, the burden of disease that a, uh, could be present, prevented by a vaccine, various implementation issues, and the economic analysis is interesting because I think if we went around the room and said, how should we consider the cost of a vaccine in making a recommendation? I mean, if it saves uh, 10 lives and it costs a million dollars, is that worth it? Well, if one of those lives is someone you know and love, it is. So the economic analysis are discussed at ACIP, but they're not voted on. So the, each individual member utilizes his or her personal feelings and background uh, when discussing uh, vaccines at ACIP with regard to the economic portion of it. The economic analysis data are presented at each of the ACIP meetings for the specific vaccines, but how they're utilized is independent of the presentations and only individualized. Evidence tables are used to summarize the benefits, harms, strengths, and limitations of the studies. 
Now, this is a, a vaccine. This is a child and adolescent uh, vaccine. The adults are very similar. And it's really amazing the thought process that goes into this display of all this very, very complex data. You can see here on the upper left, the, uh, um, there's information that you can get about vaccines. VAERS is on there. There's websites, telephone numbers. Most people don't know that it's there. This is for the child schedule, the same thing you can see for the adult schedule. And then below that, on the lower left, you can see that the vaccine schedules are approved uh, by various groups. So when the ACIP makes recommendations, it makes it on behalf of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, which they are, on the American Academy of Pediatrics for pediatric ones, uh, American Academy of Family Physicians, American College of OB, and the Internal Medicine Societies. So the recommendations that come from ACIP carry the weight of all of these organizations because they work very closely with ACIP to make sure that the vaccine recommendations are appropriate for people in their specific societies. So it's a combined operation. On the right-hand side is a table that was added a couple of years ago to the uh, uh, vaccine schedules. It shows the vaccine type, the abbreviation, and brands. And this is very helpful to many of us because it's hard to remember the brand names of various vaccines. All of that is there specifically in the immunization schedules, uh, both as the vaccine type and the combination vaccines. Now, there, there are several recommendations. The ACIP meets three times a year. Um, and recommendations were made in the October 2019 ACIP meeting. Uh, childhood, in the October meeting each year, the childhood and adult immunization schedules are approved. Uh, ACI approves them, and then they go to the CDC center director. He or she signs off of them. They're published in MMWR, and they're official. So that's the process for making vaccines official. The immunization schedules at the October meeting are voted on by ACIP, and then once published, become official. So the October meeting is when they're finalized. Then they go to the director. Uh, and then are published at MMWR, and the other society organizations publish them. The 2019-20 influenza vaccine uh, recommendations were made, hepatitis A and meningococcal B. So these are just a few of the considerations at ACIP. What I might, one thing that I think it's important to remember is the, the CDC website, www.cdc.gov. You can go on there and hit vaccines and you'll find out everything you ever want to know about vaccines. It's really exciting. So if you go there, don't go when you have something else to do that day because you're not going to be able to get away from the websites. They really contain a lot of information and, and are very, very exciting. Okay, currently the ACIP recommendations fall into category A and category B. Category A recommendations are made for all people at a specific age uh, uh, group. So like a, an adult will have category A recommendations if it's for all the adults in that, in that age group. Category B recommendations are made for individual clinical decision making so that you have uh, an adult population and you have a whole group of individuals who are renal transplants or other underlying conditions. The recommendations may be slightly different for that group uh, than they would be for the whole population in general. And then they're, they're considered under category B recommendations. Um, ACIP is moving toward an evidence to decision recommendations framework uh, and may not use the above categories in the future. So the grade process is utilized now for consideration of all vaccines. It's a standardized way to evaluate the recommendations. They're moving now for, for uh, evidence to recommendation. I'm not going to get into that because it's a little complicated, but it is a standardized way that data are uh, evaluated and presented. Now, an example of a, an ACIP Category B recommendations. We all remember when uh, human papillomavirus vaccine was approved and, and uh, by the ACIP, licensed and then approved for prevention of external genital warts type 6 and 11 in 9 to 26-year-old males. The prevention of the invasive disease caused by in meningitis, this is the second one, serogroup B in this age group is listed, and then uh, hepatitis B um, uh, in adults greater than 60 years of age with diabetes. So um, these are three examples of specific uh, recommendations that the ACIP uh, made into category B recommendation. The B recommendation is you can use it or you don't have to use it, but it's strongly recommended that it be implemented. 
whereas the A recommendation is everybody should get it. The, and the B, I misspoke a little bit. The B is a little bit more for specific individuals, specific diseases, or specific cases, whereas A is for everybody. Now, once the Center for Disease Control has an approval, this is the approval process uh, following an ACIP vaccine recommendation. And again, ACIP considers vaccine, uh, they vote upon it, they approve it, uh, then it goes to the CDC director, and it's, if he or she approves it, it's adopted by the agency uh, and, and, and implemented. Then the vaccine recommendations are published in MMWR weekly as a policy note, generally within two months of the ACIP vote. We try to get it out as quickly as possible after a vote so that the vaccines can then be implemented. It also can come into recommendations and reports uh, within six to eight months of an ACIP. So these specifically are the mechanisms of how these are published so that all of us then can utilize. And again, the important thing to remember is that recommendations become official CDC and HHS policy upon publication in the MMWR. Once the CDC licenses it, of course, it goes to Health and Human Resources, and they also uh, will generally always have, approve it and have no problems with it. So that's the basic process that uh, CDC has utilized. Now, are the, a, are the FDA recommendations and the ACIP recommendations, I mean, start over, are the FDA licensure for a vaccine and the ACIP recommendations for that vaccine always the same? No, they're not always the same. And this is where it gets a little bit confusing. Uh, Christina Bell wrote a paper uh, with Andy Shane and I uh, trying to clarify this. Now, this slide shows differences between the FDA licensure and the ACIP vaccine considerations. High risk groups, there are 12 differences. Uh, age, six differences. Administration schedule, four differences. Why are there differences between the FDA licensure and the ACIP recommendations? Well, the differences occur because of the databases that are utilized by the two groups. As I said, the FDA only considers data that are submitted by the vaccine manufacturer. The vaccine manufacturers do huge studies to evaluate their drug before they submit it to the FDA. And that's what the FDA considers, only the vaccine manufacturer's submissions. The ACIP, on the other hand, considers what the uh, FDA has, has looked at, all the data and the recommendations, but they also look at other studies. They, they look at a study that Dave has done that the FDA didn't include, but it's a very good study. And they'll look at that study. They'll look at international studies. They look at a lot of, a much broader database to make their recommendations. And although the FDA licensure and the ACIP recommendations are often the same, you can see here, there's a lot of differences. Now, what do we go by? Well, basically, we all go by the ACIP recommendations. That's what we go by. The confusing part is that if we have a, a, a drug company representative in the office and we ask him or her what a recommendation should be, he or she is not allowed to comment on ACIP recommendations. They're only allowed to comment on the FDA recommendations. So the, the, the representatives that work for the pharmaceutical companies are stuck with the FDA recommendations, where the rest of us in the real world uh, utilize uh, um, the ACIP recommendations, which are general, generally broader. Now, these are some examples of differences between the FDA licensure and the ACIP recommendations. And on the left is the vaccine, the FDA, and ACIP. Tdap during pregnancy. <clears throat> Tdap was studies have been done during pregnancy, but there uh, more need to be done to look at safety. FDA did not license it for, for um, pregnancy because the drug companies didn't specifically study this in enough detail in pregnant women to uh, have li FDA license it. Whereas ACIP considered a lot of studies that were done in various academic institutions and some internationally that looked at Tdap during pregnancy and showed that it is good, it's safe, and can be utilized. Rabies post exposure <laughs> prophylaxis. The FDA, because of information submitted by the pharmaceutical company, considers it to be a five dose uh, regimen. The ACIP recommends that you don't need five doses, you only need four doses. So a lot of data were looked at, again, that the FDA didn't look at and said, we don't need five doses of this, we need four. And that's why that difference occurred. And most of the times, you'll, <clears throat> when we see what's written from the um, 
uh, comes from the ACIP, <clears throat> what comes from all our society organizations, what's in the uh, schedules, immunization schedules, it'll be four doses because that's the ACIP recommendations. Flu mist was licensed two through 49 years of age, was not recommended for the 2017, 2018, because the ACIP felt there wasn't quite enough data. So these are examples of where there are differences. FDA licensure, we really don't, we pay attention to it, but the major attention that most of us pay is to the ACIP recommendations, which are broader because more data are considered. Now, objective two, major components of and participatory groups in the US vaccine program. Once the FDA licenses a vaccine and the ACIP approves that vaccine for certain indications, then there's a whole bunch of organizations and committees and so on that kick in to make sure that these vaccines are uh, utilized. Those, these include the following. The Vaccine Injury and Compensation Program. This is a federal program that's set up to compensate people who may have been damaged or injured, or none of those, uh, by a vaccine that's given. Uh, this injury compensation program gives out millions of dollars a year to people who claim they were injured. Some of them were by vaccines, most of them are, were not. It's a fairly liberal program, um, and more data about that can be found on the website if you want. So there is a program that if someone truly is injured, if, if we give a, uh, an adult uh, a vaccine and there's a major injury that could be associated with that vaccine, the injury compensation program will compensate that person for time loss and, and whatever else they utilize to consider it. It's a lot of money that's given out. Some of it, the vaccines did cause it. Others are questionable. But it's a good program. It's a good support program uh, if vaccines do or are found to cause a problem. The Vaccines for Children program, being a pediatrician, this is a wonderful program because it ensures that poor kids in this country uh, who have enough problems as it is, they can get their vaccines free. So uh, the Vaccines for Children's program is a program where children and adolescents can receive their vaccines at no charge. Private health insurance will cover vaccines almost immediately. Uh, state health departments are very implemental. Uh, Oregon has a great state health department in, in ensuring that these vaccines are given to the population for which they are recommended. And then, of course, we have our state school entry immunization laws. And it's very interesting now because out there we have a group of people who are anti-vaccine. And any of you who deal with the population realize that this is a very active anti-vaccine group. I, I don't, so I won't make any, com any comments about what I think of them, but um, they, they are anti-vaccine and most of the times they have no support uh, for this. So what they're doing of course is, is going to parents and having groups and getting parents together saying, your kids shouldn't get immunized. They should not be immunized before they go to school. There's no need for that. And so the parents buy into this and they're in some states, they're trying to change the school entry immunization laws so that there's no requirement uh, for a kid to get immunized to go into school. Um, I dealt with this personally when our, um, our son, who lives in San Diego, uh, has a child, a little grandchild to us, is six years old. The child had AOL, um, had leukemia, and was in the hospital for months. And the whole, the, uh, whole school and all the parents, of course, were really behind this child to, make sure the child got better emotionally and physically. Child got better, went into the, his classroom. There were a couple parents in there who wouldn't allow their children to be immunized. So here you have a um, six-year-old kid who just went through hell with uh, chemotherapy and radiation. The chance of somebody bringing measles into the, uh, daycare, into the child because of, he's not immunized was real. So. Um, the parents were able to get the laws in that specific school changed so that kids in the school had to be appropriately immunized. Um, the basis for that, of course, was a potentially immunocompromised child. You didn't want that child to get it. Measles is very contagious and, uh, and a bad disease. We'll go over that in a minute. So this is the vaccine energy compensation, which is a great program, and the VFC is a great program, as, as are the others listed here. Now, prevention and control of seasonal influenza. Uh, the recommendations of the ACIP uh, for the flu vaccines uh, are published here. If you want to go find these, just go to the website I gave, www.cdc.gov, go to influenza, and it'll have the whole thing pictured out for you. Now, what I did is we wrote for um, pediatrics the um, 10 facts about influenza. So I just want to read a couple of those because they're things that we don't often think about that we should. 
So this is about the 2018, 2019, last year's season of flu and how we can utilize it to predict potentially what's gonna happen this year. So the 2018-19, the, the last year's season, was a modest severity, but was the longest in, in, in history for the last 10 or 15 years. So it was only moderately severe, but it lasted for a long period of time. We have no idea how long the flu season is gonna last this year. Secondly, the, the season last year had two separate waves, if you remember. There was a wave of influenza that came and then sort of went away and we were really happy, this is great, we're done, uh-uh, we weren't done, a second wave came. They were both influenza A. We didn't have any influenza B last year. It was all influenza A. The first breakthrough was H1N1, and the second one was an H3N2. So they were different strains of influenza. So this year, when we see the uh, influenza sort of tapering off and maybe going away, it may not. It may come back with a, with a different strain, which is uh, really a pain. So for the last year's uh, influenza season, it lasted for 21 months from September, and we're already into flu season this year, from September through May. It went all the way into May, which is kind of late for a, a flu, but uh, it, it, it hung around. What it's going to do this year and whether we can use these data to predict what it's going to do this year uh, is hard to say. Influenza, as I said, A predominated last year, no B. Does that mean we're going to have influenza B this year? Who knows? We'll wait and see. And then flu recommend, immunization is recommended for everybody. Now, the vaccine injury compensation program that I mentioned um, is really a, a very good one. The National Childhood Injury Act of 1986 uh, was created, uh, and it began on October 1st of 1988. So this program has been going on since 1988. Um, when we had our last NVAC, National Vaccine Advisory Committee meeting, there is a report by the National Immunization Compensation Program Committee, and they've reported on how many um, uh, file, claims they had filed and, and, and paid for. And so we ask, well, what's happened for the last five years or the last 10 years? Well, they hadn't put all those, they probably know the data, but they hadn't put all those data together to publish. So they're doing that, and we'll get the information uh, about how much has been given out to people who were or thought they were injured from vaccines through this program. So we'll have those data hopefully fairly soon. Um, the injury compensation program may provide financial compensation to people who file a petition and are found to have an injury, as I said. And even, this is interesting because even in cases in which such a finding is not made, in other words, somebody claims that they were injured, the finding was not there, uh, petitioners may receive compensation. So they may get compensated even though there's been no association between a specific event and the vaccine. Um, the VIC covers both recipient and contact. So in, in other words, if um, one of my kids gets immunized with measles and goes home and we've got a child with immune deficiency and the child gets measles from the child who got immunized, you can file for compensation and we'll probably would win that case. So it's not only recipients, but also contacts of people who have been immunized, which I think is a really fair program and one that I don't think is fully recognized, but it's a, it's a fair program. There are a lot of attempts, of course, to misuse it. The VSV program, the Vaccines for Children, uh, is a great program. Um, it was started in 1994. Uh, it ensures that uh, eligible children uh, do not contract vaccine preventable diseases because they're an inability to pay. We have a lot of people, a lot of children in this country, unfortunately, that uh, live in poverty. Uh, this will enable them to get the vaccines free of charge. Okay, the way that's done on this bullet here, uh, CDC buys vaccines at a discount, distributes to them to grantees, <clears throat> and as I said, the Oregon Health Department participates in, in this, as do all the health departments throughout the United States. <clears throat> and then lastly, a child is eligible uh, for the VFC program uh, if he or she is less than 19 years of age, uh, Medicaid eligible, uninsured, or underinsured. So all of those individuals can uh, apply. And the application and awarding of the funds is, is really fairly liberal. Uh, it's not, not real rigid like some things. This is really designed to help people get immunized. American Indian and Alaskan Natives are also a category that's impl included. Now, <clears throat> what are the sources of publication of childhood and adult immunizations? This is, to me, this is having worked in this area with all these organizations, and those of you who work with your organizations know that this, this was a real feat. This was not easy, but when the 
uh, ACIP uh, approves and the director approves a vaccine recommendation, then all of the, all of the other uh, organizations that sit around the table at ACIP that participate in work groups and are very actively involved with CDC to make recommendations so that when they make a recommendation, the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Family Physicians, the American College of Physicians, they all have contributed and they all are in sync about these recommendations that have been made such that when they're published in January, the, uh, the uh, vaccine schedule is published in January, children and pediatrics. They're not only published in MMWR, but they're published in all these society journals and others that I've not included. So it's not easy. Uh, for instance, last year, the American College of Physicians wanted to make sure <clears throat> that their publication of the schedule was before the CDC's publication. So they wanted to be first. And um, I know that interns sometimes are fairly anal, but this was an expression of one time they wanted to be first. And I can understand that. And so that was compensated for and, and, and helped. But the good thing then in summary is that a the ACIP makes a recommendation, it's published in MMWR, at the same time it's published in a whole group of journals. So the same thing is coming out. And really, uh, now that it's all standardized and coordinated, makes it uh, a much better and less confusing system. And again, these are just uh, in writing what I just showed in the last slide. CDC, <clears throat> pediatrics, family physicians, OBGYN, college of physicians, and the nurse, mid the nurse midwives. <clears throat> I'm just going to add here that the nurses are very active in um, the ACIP recommendations. There's a nurse that serves, serves on the ACIP. Uh, one slot is designated for nursing. The nursing societies are there at all of the um, meetings, sitting around the table, and are very active in participating in all aspects of uh, uh, vaccine recommendations by ACIP. Okay, we'll forget that. I don't know what that means. Um, objective three, lessons learned from making vaccine recommendations. <clears throat> when a recommendation is made, uh, just like when we do something, if we do something, there are some events that may occur after that that we didn't think would happen. The same thing happens when vaccine recommendations are made. So we got together and published a part of an article, Lessons Learned from Making and Implementing Vaccine Recommendations. Some of these are positive, some of them are negative, and there's no way that anyone thought that this could happen. So some of the lessons that have been learned from these vaccine recommendations are the unanticipated positive effect so I'm going to show a, a slide in a minute where immunization of children with pneumococcal vaccine resulted in a huge savior of disease in adults called the herd effect or community protection. Consequences of vaccine recommendations when they are changed to minimize adverse events. Thirdly, different vaccines to prevent infection from the same organism may cause confusion, and it's often confusing. And the public perception of a vaccine or the disease prevented can hinder vaccine uptake. So, like I said, many people now are convinced that MMR is associated with autism and they won't have their children immunized. And that's, that's difficult. Once you have a mindset, it's difficult to change it. So I want to give two examples of this. Unanticipated positive effects of a vaccine, both in the population for which it was uh, recommended in the community. And this is, really, this is a really neat finding, I think. Pneumococcal vaccine was approved, uh, conjugated pneumococcal vaccine uh, for use in children huge effect on adults that weren't immunized but were around these protected children. I'll show a slide. Rotavirus vaccine. Rotavirus is a common cause of diarrhea in, in infants. Rotavirus vaccine use in children so that the rotavirus <laughs> disease went down and guess what else happened? The hospitalizations due to rotavirus vaccine and the seizures due to the fever associated with the rotavaccines, they also all went down. That was really not anticipated. But this one is really, this is a wonderful slide. I think this is amazing. This is the impact of seven valent pneumococcal conjugate vaccine on the rate of invasive pneumococcal disease. So on the left-hand slide is, deals with children less than five years of age, as you can see here. On the right-hand side are people over 65 years of age. <clears throat> this shows the cases per 100,000 population up and down, and across the bottom are years. Right here is where, on the left-hand side, uh, polypneumococcal 7-valent was introduced. These are conjugated vaccines that was introduced, and you can see the red lines. Right when it was introduced, you saw a marked decrease 
in pneumococcal disease due to PCV7 in pediatric population. Wonderful, it was great. But now you move over to the right, and these are people over 65 years of age, didn't receive the vaccine, but when it was introduced, you can see here, right here, you can see again, the same thing happened in the over 65 population. There was a major decrease in pneumococcal conjugated vaccines, even though the adults didn't receive it. They benefited from having the children who oftentimes pass the organisms on to their grandparents uh, from getting this disease. So a lot of lives were saved, and this was something that really was not anticipated. At least maybe some real smart people anticipated, but a lot of us didn't anticipate this. A remarkable secondary event. <clears throat> Next I mentioned is the, the trends and rate of seizure associated hospitalization among children less than five before and after rotavirus. And basically, what it showed, as I already mentioned, is that when rotavirus was given to infants, diarrhea decreased, fever decreased, hospitalizations decreased, so there was a big benefit of that vaccine. Next is HPV, human papillomavirus. What happened here? How did, what was the secondary effect here? Well, there was a population level herd protection of males from a female human papillomavirus vaccine program, and this is done in Australia. But what it showed, skipping down to the conclusions, that this is the first zero survey confirming broad protection level impacts in males from female immunization. On uh, our, their research uh, may assist policymakers in considering uh, activities. So this doesn't really seem too strange because if you have a group of women who carry HPV who are very sexually active and they're all immunized, their HPV goes away, the males can't get it from them. But if you have a group of women who have HPV and, and, and no clinical symptoms, even asymptomatic, uh, any sexual activity they have with a male, there's a good chance that that male may get uh, HPV. Um, but this study showed that you immunize the human female population, not only did HPV go down in the females that were immunized, but also in the males who they contacted. So if you're going out and have a new partner, make sure they've had their HPV. That was a joke. <laughs> okay, um, now the importance of herd protection. Herd protection is very important and, and something that's really misunderstood. Um, history and the definition, herd immunity is really what it is. It's not protection, it's herd immunity, and it's really community immunity, but herd protection is a cooler term. It was initially discussed in 1923 uh, the term was not used widely until recent decades, and it was stimulated by the use of an increase in, in the vaccines and the costs and benefits of those vaccines. Now, herd immunity versus herd protection, as I said, is, they're not exactly the same, but for this discussion, they are. So the risk of infection among susceptible people in a population is reduced by the presence of the proximity of immune people. Now, this was an, uh, Evan Anderson uh, uh, published this article in Clinical Infectious Diseases, and the basis of it is, is this. The blue are not immunized, but they're still healthy. The red are not immunized, but they're sick and contagious, and the yellow are immunized and healthy. So here you've got a population of people that are not immunized in the blue. You introduce into that population somebody who has measles. Who is not immunized, but they're, who is not immunized and they're sick and they're contagious. So this little red guy here is sick, unimmunized, and a potential source of infection. And look what happens. Basically, you have a big outbreak because people are not immunized; they get the disease. The second level is here, where you have um, the blue not immunized, still healthy. You have the uh, yellow immunized and healthy. So you have some of the population that's immunized. And then, of course, you're going to have a lot of disease because enough of the population is not immunized. And I'll, as I'll say in a minute, it takes 90% of the population to be immunized to prevent uh, outbreaks. And we'll get to that, but that's in a minute. So, and here you've got <clears throat> over 90% of the population in yellow is immunized. You get some people that's introduced. You'll get a few cases that'll be breakthrough or whatever, but most of the people will be protected. Now, this is a, I had the opportunity to uh, go to Austin, Texas, uh, where the University of Texas is located. 
and my son and I, we have some friends there, so we got some tickets to go see West Virginia where I went to school, play University of Texas, where I was on the faculty for a while. So we were up in the little room up here where people eat and drink and everything before you go to the game, and we walked out, and holy mackerel, it was unbelievable. 100,000 people were there, all dressed in orange. And so I thought, gee, many Christmas, this is a good, good opportunity to have a good outbreak. Um, <laughs> and I thought, well, okay, maybe it won't be respiratory. I would think more in this kind of an outbreak it would be enteric. This is a perfect place where you're going to get a lot of diarrhea. It didn't happen, thank heavens, but it has happened in the past. But, and by the way, West Virginia won. OK. Um, now, measles. Measles is a very contagious disease. It's a bad disease. This is a number of uh, 20, 2019 measles cases surpasses it for 2018. So um, 2019, there's more cases than you saw in 2018 as the 387 cases the U.S. experienced the second largest number of reported measles cases since the disease was considered eliminated. And I can tell you, if we don't keep immunizing, it's going to go up even more. Measles was confirmed in 15 states, so it's pretty widespread. And this is the number of measles, this is the number of measles cases reported by year, which just gives from 2010 at the bottom up to 2019. It's not a linear curve. 2014 was higher. Why it was higher than that, I don't have any idea. But you can see that they're plopping along. Now, let's see. Yeah. OK. The, the reproduction number, R, of an infection. This is the infectiveness of a specific organism. It's a concept in epidemiology uh, of infectious diseases. It measures how infectious disease is spread it required to determine the number needed to vaccinate. This is the important one. The R factor requires, it's required to determine the number needed to vaccinate to achieve herd immunity. So how many people do we have to have immunized to prevent outbreaks? So the basic reproductive number is the expected number of secondary cases, this is the RO, expected number of secondary cases produced by a typical primary case over the course of its infectious period, the incubation period, in an entirely susceptible population. So if you have a, say we're all susceptible, and somebody with measles comes in, uh, we're going to get measles. There's going to be a good percentage of us get measles. This slide shows the approximate basic reproductive numbers, the number that needs to be immunized before you can say that you're protected. And the two big ones here are measles and pertussis. Measles, this is the R0. The crude herd immunity threshold, which is the last column that's important right here, means that we have to have 92 to 94 percent of the population immunized against measles to prevent outbreaks. Same with pertussis. You have to have 92 to 94 percent protected to prevent outbreaks. All the other diseases is much lower. You know, they're in the 80 percent. So, this is important to remember, that we can't give up. We can, we can say we're doing a good job, but unless we've got 90% of the population in our lives, we're going to continue to have outbreaks. And what happens frequently is you'll have a susceptible person that comes in and goes and travels internationally, and that person is one. The people that come back for, uh, after acquiring measles internationally and introducing it to this country are where a lot of the outbreaks have occurred. So I think the couple lessons to take home, one is if you've got individuals who are traveling internationally, make sure they're up on their immunizations, particularly <laughs> MMR and pertussis, and depending on their age groups. And secondly is people who are not traveling internationally, we have to continue to ensure that everybody is immunized or we're going to continue to see outbreaks. 90% is a pretty high crude immunity threshold level to achieve. OK, again, <clears throat> recommendations made during the October ACIP, uh, hepatitis A vaccine for the homeless. There's a lot of uh, hepatitis A occurring now in, in this country. And I know San Diego has had a big outbreak because there's a lot of homeless people that live there. So homeless need to be immunized not only against other diseases, but particularly hepatitis A. Uh, child inhalation, childhood adolescent immunizations needs to be followed as we do with the adult schedule. So this is an example of the uh, ACIP meeting. This was a meeting they had just a couple weeks ago uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. I might 
suggest that anybody who wants to go to an ACIP meeting, and if you're ever around in Atlanta when they're having one, it's, it's phenomenal the way it's conducted and the, and the work that goes into it and the quality of the people that are on the committee, which is the second thing. Anybody who's interested in joining the ACIP, uh, the members are selected after application. They're from all over the country. So anybody here who may be interested, go to the ACIP website, uh, go to ACIP, and you can find out how to um, get on the ACIP or at least to apply. It, the meetings are fascinating. And then lastly is the meetings are also televised. So that if you're interested in, say, flu and what ACIP is going to do with a flu vaccine, you can look at it on your computer. And again, go to the CDC website and it tells you how to do that. So you can see um, how immunizations are made. And this is a website. It's here. If you don't want to remember all that, you can just remember vaccines and scroll around and you're going to find it. It's a pretty easy website to use. Oh, the other thing that I find handy, particularly if you're doing something or giving a talk or something, um, the ACIP vaccine recommendations are not only listed by year, they're also listed by specific vaccine. So you can go into the website and you say, okay, click. What, what has happened to meningococcal vaccine? You can click on meningococcal vaccine. You can see the exact status of the recommendations. You can also get it from the website, uh, the schedule. But this is a very good uh, slide and, and website because it tells you exactly uh, what you want to know about each of the specific diseases. And then you also can look at it another way. You can do vaccine-specific recommendations by date. So you can go to 2018 and click on there, and it'll tell you what vaccines were uh, recommendations were made in the year 2018. And you can see it for the year. So it divides them into year, and it divides them into specific uh, uh, times. OK, now, there, there were two anniversaries. There were two anniversaries. There are many, but these are two important ones in 2018. One was the uh, 1918 uh, anniversary of the flu pandemic, which killed a lot of people in 1918. Uh, MMR uh, was induced in 1998, and in the MMR enteropathy was induced in 1998, and autism article was published in Lancet by Wakefield. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of those. In 1918, the influenza pandemic. Um, the influenza pandemic of 1918, uh, which is 100 years ago last year, uh, infected about 500 million people worldwide. It killed an estimated 20 to 50 million people. Uh, 675,000 Americans and 50 to 100 million people worldwide died during this pandemic. It was awful. There were no effective drugs, no vaccines at that time to prevent the infection. And this was the first of two pandemics involving H1N1. Now, it's interesting when you see that. I mean, this is, okay, we're reading all this and they're facts and so on, but how do we really know how this really happened? Well. My wonderful wife, uh, I was talking to her about vaccines, and she said, oh, I've got an article, a letter from uh, one of my relatives that was sent in 1918. And I said, you got to be kidding. She said, no. So she showed it to me. So this is the letter that one of her relatives wrote to one of the other relatives. This is October 16th, 1918. My dear Austin, we earnestly hope you will escape the influenza. Your letter indicates that it must be dreadful. It's letting up at Camp Sherman. Uh, from 140 deaths a day to 30 yesterday. We have had to, no school, no public gatherings of any kind in Delaware, Ohio. Since a week ago last Monday, nine soldier boys have been brought back to be buried, and over a dozen of our own residents have died in the last two weeks. This was terrible. Um, I don't think we'll have another pandemic unless we get a breakthrough influenza strain that isn't covered by the vaccine and is more virulent. But this sort of puts into perspective what the 1918 outbreak uh, of influenza was. It was, really, it was really significant. What about autism and vaccines? We hear a lot about autism and vaccines, and it was from this guy named uh, Wakefield, published this article in Lancet, uh, ileolymphoid nodular hyperplasia um, disease was associated with uh, MMR. This article should never have been accepted by Lancet. They, they withdrew it afterwards. It's been retracted. But it really is the basis for a lot of parents saying that autism is associated with MMR. We're still arguing to get this uh, perception uh, negated. So basically, we got a group of people together, Mady Hornick and Ian Lipkin from Columbia, uh, and a group of other people, um, including 
the three laboratories that uh, were involved in, in studies. Two of the laboratories, one CDC, another in this country, and the original laboratory that Wakefield used, they were also part of this. This did a study looking at the association between measles virus and autism enteropathy. It was a case control, control study. It was really well designed. Mady is an outstanding uh, uh, scientist, as is her husband, ex-husband. Um, so this was the background. They, they developed a, a, a study that was very similar to um, what Wakefield did and showed, I won't give you all the information, but their study showed that there was no association between measles and autism. We knew that, but a well-conducted study that tried to replicate uh, Wakefield's original one was done. It didn't replicate it. It shows, it's a well-done study. It shows there's no association. Okay, let's see. Okay, next is a, a polio-like illness. We're, we're beginning to see another condition that is similar to what we saw a long time ago with polio, which we don't see anymore in this country or anywhere. A recent epidemic of a polio-like illness has reached West Virginia with one confirmed case in the state in 2019. So they had a case of, uh, it turned out to be acute flaccid myelitis that came in and presented exactly like polio. And everybody was, of course, really somewhat worried about this didn't turn out to be polio, and it's taken a while to indicate what it was, but it was acute flaccid myelitis. Uh, it's a paralyzing illness of childhood. It's clinically similar to polio, and some of the old timers um, that have seen polio um, would, would uh, can appreciate what this means. There were 228 confirmed victims in 2018. 90% of victims have been children, mostly four to six years of age, and it's caused by an enterovirus, enterovirus D68. So this enterovirus presents, and if you see people that come in with a uh, illness similar to what polio looked like, or um, uh, then it's, be sure to check for this uh, virus. It's a D68. Most health departments are, are clearly well aware of it. Death is rare and complete recovery, thankfully, uh, heavens, with, uh, is unusual. Polio recovery was not the way that it usually turned out. With uh, enterovirus D68, uh, death is rare, thank heavens, the complete recovery is unusual. This basically, you know, started in West Virginia with one case. It shows a couple things. One, a good reporting system. Most reporting systems go to the state health department. State health departments are really very good, and the one here is excellent. So it started out with somebody recognizing something was wrong, uh, and the individual who saw this thought initially it was polio because it looked just like it reported it to the state health department, it was evaluated, other cases were reported, and by a lot of very good scientific endeavor, the cause of acute flaccid, flaccid myelitis was uh, determined. And, and I imagine that somebody is working on a vaccine for this, whether or not it'll be necessary, whether or not um, this is gonna spread or it's gonna be contained, since there's no therapy and no vaccine, time will tell. But if you see a patient that presents like this, this is what it is. Okay, conclusions. ACIP, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice, uh, is the center of vaccine policy in the United States, and it's what we follow. We generally don't follow the FDA package inserts, although you can. We follow the ACIP uh, recommendations. And again, ACIP goes to the director, director goes to C is at the CDC, and they approve it, and it goes to HHS in this final. So these are national recommendations. Recommendations have the force of law. There's no mandate that, have, that the vaccines are provided to at no cost to any child. Uh, they set the medical clinical standard of care in the US and fit into a larger governmental advisory structure. The FDA uh, states what vaccines can be used. And again, it's based on what is submitted to them by the vaccine manufacturer. And they, the vaccine manufacturer spend millions of dollars doing their studies and they submit it to them. And then the ACIP considers that, but also a lot of additional data that FDA doesn't. Uh, ACIP recommends how, when, and why to use uh, uh, the vaccines. Oops. And every day then in the United States, there's 11,000 births that occur. That means we, we have to start the immunization program all over again uh, each day for the new 11,000 critters that, that join us. The immunizations have really been remarkable. Um, I can remember a while back where many of these preventable diseases that weren't preventable. Now we can prevent them. We just have to utilize the immunizations that are available appropriately. So with that, I'll end. Thank you. Larry's left lots of time for questions. We'll start on the left. Yes. 
comment on the cost and uh, shortages of the shingles vaccine? Yeah. Any comments on the shortages of the shingles vaccine? Or? And the cost. Of the vaccine itself. Yeah, I'll start with the latter one. The cost of the vaccine itself, I like a private citizen, don't like to pay a lot of money for the Zoster vaccines. The costing is determined by the manufacturers uh, and the, the, the public people don't have anything to do with costing. It's the manufacturers set the policy. Some of us feel some of the vaccines are too expensive. You can contact the various people with the state health department or the manufacturers themselves and complain. I, I don't, I'm sure it'll make a difference. So that was the cost. What was the other part? Oh yeah, the shortages. The shortages have. We want to have a good, good and a bad. The, the good part of the shortages is that um, it's being used, so we we ran out. Uh, the bad part is the vaccine manufacturer. This is not an easy vaccine to make. They they make the vaccine. They want to make as much as they can. They're trying to make as much as they can, but it, there's a shortage. There's not much we can do. There's only one manufacturer that makes it. They're doing the best they can and. Uh, what, what I would recommend is that people go to different places. Um, Mimi and I got our vaccine shortages at Publix, which is a grocery store in, in Atlanta. It was really interesting. We walked into Publix, because um, it's a fairly expensive vaccine, but we walked into Publix. They said, okay, uh, get your Zoster vaccine. We both got our Zoster vaccine, and they gave us a $10 credit for come back to the store to buy things in the store. So we didn't have to pay anything, and yet we get $10 for it. I don't understand that kind of business whatsoever. but. That's what happened. The, the other thing that I may mention to you is that when you get the, the newer Zoster vaccine, it hurts because there's an adjuvant in it, and the adjuvant is there to make it higher levels. So be ready for it. It is going to hurt, and, and patients that you see that they're going to get the Zoster vaccine, just tell them that it's going to hurt, and it does hurt. I mean, it was tender like three or four days. I mean, that's not a big deal, but for some people it is. Yeah, right behind the foot. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I don't have exact figures, but oh, yeah. the question is, how is the United States doing with regard to immunizing people compared to other countries? So that's a broad-based question, but I know why you're asking. I think probably if you go to Canada, they may be a little bit better than we are, but all the other countries, it varies. So I don't have those specific data. But if you go to the CDC website, there's a place that you can ask questions, and they may have some data specifically on other countries. Uh, that would have to be data that are gathered by those countries. So I don't know the answer to that. But in some countries, the data probably are available. Some of the others are probably not available. But you would think in Western Europe, it's probably it's pretty high. good. Yeah. But in Asia, at yeah. least parts of Asia, maybe not so good. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Very good point. We'll switch sides. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's a very good question, okay? Uh, what happens is the um, ACP committee is formed by the CDC. This is a committee that the CDC conducts uh, and puts together. Uh, they support it uh, by travel and so on to come to the meeting. So the CDC, this is a CDC committee. The ACIP is a specific CDC committee. None of the members of the ACIP are government employees. So none of the members are ACIP members. They're all people like us that are out in the community. Physicians, nurses, there's a, a lay person that's on there. So it's a group of individuals who have no government ties whatsoever and no FDA ties. Uh, they're all screened for conflicts of interest. Uh, then they're, they're appointed to the ACIP. They serve a four-year term. Um, <clears throat> the committee meets uh, three times a year. Uh, they hear all the data uh, from people about the vaccine recommendations over the two days they're there. Uh, they then will make a vote on the vaccine and say if it's for Zoster for old people, they'll vote yes. And then that ACIP recommendation goes to the director of the CDC, and then he approves it, and once he or she approves it, it's published. So the, the involvement, I'm sorry. I was going to say, is that a rubber stamp? No. No. Um, you mean a rubber stamp from the CDC director? No. It, it is not a rubber stamp, but it is um, 
most of the times, most of the times if there's a question that the CDC director has, he'll, he'll give it to the, AC, the uh, CDC person who works with the ACIP and they'll get it resolved. So most of the questions are resolved before they go to ACIP. They're not gonna send something to ACIP that isn't absolutely complete. And the committee members, I mean, if I named them, that you'd know them. They're all mostly academic people, uh, people in private practice. It's a, a very good group of individuals. Yes. Does the government free vaccine program cover undocumented people? Does the uh, uh, Vaccines for Children's program cover undocumented people? I want to say yes to that because I think that people come in and they'll give it to people who are needy, they their forms to fill out, and I would say that the answer is yes, but I'm not absolutely positive. We can check with the health department and find that out. Is there someone here from the health department? I haven't seen anybody. Okay. Yes. Um, can you give us an idea of the number of people who are compensated in the vaccine competition program and how much money that program spends? Yeah, that's a really good question. I know that question was asked at the last National Vaccine Advisory Committee. Um, the, the, it's millions of dollars, I can tell you that. I don't know exact figure. It's millions of dollars, and they're, they're, I don't know the exact numbers. But if you go to the vaccines, to the website of that organization, the, the data should be there. So millions of dollars, a lot of kids, I know that, but I can't give you a specific, a specific I'm number. I'm surprised. Yeah, we got a single question about the flu vaccine. Yeah. What about uh, rubella? It's not nearly as contagious as, as measles. In these communities where the children are not receiving any vaccine, does, does that outbreak in general with the whole baby? Yeah, that's a very good point. I think, the, I think a couple, no, they're, they're not. Now, the issue is there may be rubella that occurs that isn't diagnosed. It may be diagnosed as a, a respiratory tract disease or whatever. Uh, secondly is that um, the contagiousness of rubella, it's probably easier for a child who interacts with other children to get exposed to measles than a baby is to get rubella. So that may be another reason. And, and we don't see rubella, which is uh, a good, your point is a good one. It's surprising that we, that we don't. We do see mumps and we do see measles, of course, but rubella, I think the contagiousness of it also is a little bit less than measles. One last question, yes. Yeah, yeah. the question is a very good question, and I don't know the answer to, but acute flaccid myelitis, uh, what percentage, what's a denominator, what's a numerator, and what happens to those children long-term-wise? Um, long-term-wise, you know, they've just started seeing this recently, so we're not going to have many more than a year or two probably out, but I can't, I don't know those specific numbers. That's a very good question. Again, if you go to the uh, CDC website um, and get in acute flaccid paralysis that are there. If, if it's not, there'll be a number you can call and they will get you to the right person. It's really, CDC is wonderful. So that, they can answer the, so I gave you an answer to your question. It wasn't a very good one, but at least it's, yeah. So one more, nice lady, yes. What is the ACIP's stance, or has it been discussed the issues with the outbreaks happening at the Library Construction Center? Mm -hmm. um, There hasn't been at the ACIP because it's not, it, there will be if a vaccine is involved with it. So there hasn't been any. The ACIP and the various members at the ACIP are not happy with that. Um, <clears throat> I'm not there anymore, but uh, the interaction with the government officials at the CDC and those above them may conflict. And they, they publish their agenda a few weeks or months mm -hmm. before the next meeting, and it's all free. You can go online, you can go online live and watch them yeah. debate whatever issue you're interested in. I'll ask Larry to stay here at the podium because I suspect there's yet more questions tomorrow. Infectious Society of Oregon and Salem. Dr. Pickering will be talking about infectious diarrhea in addition yes. to more vaccine presentations. Thank you all so much, Dr. Pickering. Thank you. The diary of that approval, man. Yeah, yeah the, the, the migrant thing is, is a tough one. Well, it is, and they probably don't want to publicize it for political reasons. Yeah, and, and if, if the